a um, experiment. We'll be learning as we go, but we just wanted to, you know, Jeremy had the wonderful idea of us trying to put something on because the pandemic has put such a damper on everybody's education in multiple facets, um, trickling all the way down from uh, fellows down through residents, and it's definitely affecting our students as we're preparing for getting ready for going out on AI acting internships. Um, so we wanted to try and put on something, some kind of way that we can maybe help prepare people, um, maybe have opportunities for questions, things like that. So this will kind of be an evolution as we go. Uh, Jeremy, as the uh, sort of head of this whole thing, decided to put on the first lecture. So. Yeah, so um, we're going to start pretty basic on this first lecture and then work our way up with a bunch of different topics. Um, feel free to send us emails or at the end of this, if you guys want to discuss certain topics, this is very fluid. We can make it um, as you know interactive as you guys want, or we can just focus on just straight lectures. Um, as Joe was saying, we'll just kind of go with the flow uh, the next couple weeks. Um, we're going to plan on doing it once a week, Wednesdays at this time from 7 to 8-ish, and then from there, if we have like a lot of interest, we can maybe do um, maybe twice a week, but we'll see how that goes. Um, for most of you guys, if you want to ask questions, there's a chat feature here. So if you want to ask questions, just feel free to um, type in a question and then one of us will bring up that question to the group. Or if you want, we can try to just unmute yourself and then ask the question there. The issue with unmuting is sometimes people might talk over each other, so probably the chat feature is a little bit best. Um, so um, let's just get started. So like I said, this so everyone knows right before we get started, Jeremy, if you t take a screenshot or copy paste, we put our emails in the group chat in case you have any follow up questions or anything going it, on after this. I added it at the end as well. Okay. Um, I guess let's just introduce ourselves. So uh, I'm Jeremy Reha, um, PGY4. Um, I'm going to be going into trauma um, for fellowship. Uh, Joe, you guys want to introduce yourself, Jeff? Sure. Um, I'm Joe Number A. Um, I am. My name is Joe Galloway. I'm going uh, into trauma as well. Hopefully, uh, I'm currently in my PGY3 year. Joe Polito, PGY3. I'll be applying orthopedic oncology. Uh, Jeff Thompson, uh, also PGY3, uh, planning applying for sports medicine. Becca, you can introduce yourself too. <laughs> Just smile and wave. Brian's one of our interns. Um, and then we also have on this call a bunch of our incoming interns that we're excited to have. Um, Thanks for tuning in, guys. Great to see you here. All right. So let's see. All right. So we're going to just start off with basics. This lecture is going to be just uh, orthopedic physical examination. Um, then we're going to talk about a little bit of x-ray descriptions, how to read x-rays, what you should be telling your chief, uh, telling your attending. Um, and then we're going to just talk about initial immobilization, uh, sp mainly splinting. So the orthopedic physical examination has uh, about five different main topics, and we'll go through these individually. The first you want to inspect. So you want to look at the skin. Uh, you want to assess that and also look for any deformity. So the skin assessment could be as basic as looking for cellulitis or looking at open fractures. And these are two pictures I took in the trauma bay. And some of them are really obvious, like this open fracture. So this is uh, an ankle. Um, this is the medial side. The lateral side's out here. And this is the distal tibia coming through the, the skin. Pretty obvious that this is a, um, an open fracture. But this is also an open fracture where the, uh, it's a poke hole about half a centimeter in size. So if you're not closely looking for little wounds, you might miss it. Um, and if you miss an open fracture, it can eventually lead to infection or non-union. So it's important to pay close attention throughout the uh, whole exam and look at the skin top to bottom. Um, just a little thing with, with open fractures, when they're open, if you blot them, 
um, and then you come back a couple hours, it's still going to be bleeding. Rather, if it's just a laceration, you know, your body's going to clot that off. Uh, also, Joe, uh, the Joes, Jeff, if you guys have stuff, just feel free to chime in as I go. I was just going to jump in with one thing and highlight the importance of recognizing this bleeding. Um, and also, Jeremy is going to talk about the importance of a four extremity physical exam to not miss something like this because when you get down there, you are the quarterback. And so you have to uh, be able to tell the staff to administer antibiotics immediately. And it's what we know is the single best prevention of a deep infection for these types of injuries, which is what we're worried about. So recognizing this early, given two grams of ANCEF, um, plus or minus gentamicin, which we'll address on later lectures, but um, it's really, really important. So also with the inspection is looking at uh, deformities, and this could be fractures, it could be for dislocations. Um, so a lot of times it's going to be pretty obvious that this is you, both bone forearm fracture, you can see this deformity. But also sometimes you're looking in the trauma bay at a patient laying supine on, on the trauma uh, bed, and you just look at the leg. And if it's shortened, externally rotated, you have to clue yourself into thinking that it might be a hip fracture or a femur fracture just because when the bone breaks, the leg just wants to fall into that position. So just pay attention to how the legs are, are uh, oriented. Um, this is similar to with dislocations. Um, I don't know if any of you guys were watching football this past year, but um, the quarterback for Alabama, Tua, had a posterior hip dislocation with a posterior wall acetabular fracture. And this is a picture of him coming off the uh, football field. And um, you can see here that his hip is flexed. It's hard to see, but most likely his right hip is going to be shortened. Uh, his right uh, femur is going to be internally rotated, and it's going to be adducted. And this is a classic position of the leg for a posterior wall or a posterior uh, hip dislocation. Um, also, if a patient comes in with a shoulder dislocation, they're going to be in certain positions. Um, this one's classic for a inferior shoulder dislocation where the arm is stuck um, overhead, it's abducted, patient can't get it undone. Um, so the, just these things that you go down to the trauma bay, you just have to look and see how the patient's positioned and whatnot, and this can clue you into certain injuries. Uh, next, you want to palpate, um, and you, you kind of want to palpate. It's obvious when you get called down and you have a distal radius fracture, you're obviously going to palpate over that area. But if it's a polytrauma, you want to palpate throughout the whole body, um, and this is going to clue you into certain things. Sometimes there's a cold fractures that don't show up on x-ray, um, but they might be tender in certain locations. So in this picture here, um, what I'm getting at is sometimes if you have a uh, scaphoid fracture, it's not going to show up initially on x-rays. But if you have tenderness in what they call anatomic sniff, uh, snuff box, which is this area highlighted here, uh, which is a triangle between these three tendons, um, that's going to clue you into a suspected scaphoid fracture. If they're tender there, no fracture on x-ray, you still are going to cast it. You bring them back in a week and get x-rays, um, it's a high probability that you're going to see an x-ray uh, fracture line at that time. Um, or you might want to get further imaging like a CT scan or MRI. Um, similar for ankle fractures, they're going to be tender over the, AT uh, sorry, ankle sprains, they're going to be tender over the ATFL. Um, and then also you're looking at any defects in tendons. So any when you have a quadriceps rupture or patella rupture, they're going to have a defect in that area. So this here picture here is um, looking at uh, a defect in the quadriceps tendon. So here's the patella, and if you run your finger over it, you're going to sink into this defect where the uh, patella, uh, the quadricep is ruptured. Um, that's going to be similar for Achilles tendon ruptures, um, and then some other tests have uh, problems with defects in the tendons. Uh, next, you want to do a neurological exam, and this is going to include a graded motor exam, that zero to five motor strength, 
and then assess for sensation in all dermatomes. Um, it's important to have the patient either be distracted by not looking at you or have them close your eyes because sometimes they can cheat. Um, and this neurologic exam is most important when you have a spine fracture and you're uh, interested in uh, seeing if the exam's going to get worse due to um, an epidermal hematoma or if a patient has compartment syndrome that has an evolving um, exam, you want to see if that motor exam or sensation exam is getting worse because that's going to clue you into uh, dangerous things. Uh, next is a vascular exam, um, and you want to do a pulse check, and that's going to either be palpating for a pulse or use a Doppler. Um, also, for any hand uh, injuries, you want to look at cap refill. Um, that will clue you into perfusion of the fingertips. Um, and then for any lower energy, uh, uh, extremity injury, you want to do ankle brachial index. So any hip fractures, pretty much inner trochs down to the ankle. So inner trach fractures, subtroch fractures, femurs, any knee dislocations, um, proximal tibias, tibial shafts. You want to do an ankle branchial index. And what that is, is you measure the blood pressure at the ankle and compare that to the arm. Uh, in the trauma bay where we are, we have automated blood pressure cuffs for the arm that we can use. But for the lower extremity, we have to get a manual uh, cuff. You strap it around the ankle. You also get a Doppler and you put it on the uh, artery. You inflate it. And then once the Doppler signal goes away, you then uh, deflate the uh, blood pressure cuff. And once you hear the Doppler signal return, that's going to be your uh, systolic blood pressure. You take that number and you divide it by the brachial uh, systolic blood pressure and you get a ratio. Um, normal is going to be this 0.9 to 1.2. Anything point below 0.9 could have a potential vascular injury and that should get a vascular surgery uh, consult. Most of the time with fractures it's going to be vasospasm. Um, however, you can have more serious injuries to the vasculature with um, dis you know, complete disruption of them. So um, they, vascular surgery may recommend further testing like a CTA or, or uh, such like that. Um, hey, Jeremy. Yep. just want to hop in and say two things. Um, I think we have to make sure that it's important to get a DP and a PT. Um, and so what that means, dorsalis pedis and posterior tibialis pulses. And like you can see from this image, um, if, especially if you have an injury below the knee, how one artery might be affected and you might get a Sometimes you may see um, other services, just get a, a dorsalis pedis and say everything's fine. Uh, but keep in mind that these arteries do branch at these levels, and so they could be independently impacted. The other thing I wanted to make a quick point from Jeremy's last slide was, I think a lot of you see us put muscle grading in terms of the dermatomes and uh, the graded motor exam. And so the, the general guidelines that we say it's out of five, uh, five out of five is full strength, so that's muscle activation. It exempts the examiner's full resistance. Um, and then your next number you think about is three, which is muscle activation against gravity. So four is somewhere in between the two. Um, and then zero is no muscle activity at all, with one being trace like a twitch, and then essentially two is in the plane of gravity. So if you, for example, have a patient that you think their quadricep is injured, if you have them lay on their hip, and basically, they are extending their leg, um, laying on their side. This is not against gravity. That would be an example. If they could only do that, that would be a two out of five. I just think it's helpful to kind of have that in mind because a lot of you guys just see us put numbers and um, we don't really talk about it too much. Yeah. And also, you should never be putting NVI or neurovascularly intact. You should be putting out your graded motor exam. So if someone comes back to your note, they can see exactly what, that motor exam was so if there's a change everybody knows um, it's a lot easier now with uh, EMRs you can just put that in easily back in the day paper charts a lot of people put MBI and that can't you know cause issues with compartment syndrome and stuff like that um, and then the last uh, part of the physical exam is your musculoskeletal exam and this is going to include your range of motion um, testing, 
Um, and then advanced tests like knee ligamentous exams, shoulder exams, uh, further tests like um, Thompson tests, um, various specific orthopedic uh, tests for specific injuries. Um, the range of motion and tests is very important when you're getting consults for septic arthritis because um, any little micro motion, when they have extreme pain with micro motion, that's going to clue you into a potential infection in the joint. And you guys want to say specifics about... How do you spell yeah. Thompson test? <laughs> T-O-M. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, any questions about physical exam? Anybody um, want to say further things about physical exam? Keep in mind, guys, we're going to get much more in detail over the next couple lectures. We want you to just kind of have a baseline here, but ask anything you want. All right. Let's keep on going. So next we're going to go into uh, how to read x-rays. Um, so when the, the x-ray beam comes in, it's going to pass through uh, tissue, right? And so if it goes completely through air, it's going to come up black or dark here. Um, as it goes through more dense material, um, it's going to show up more white. So if it comes to metal, it's going to be completely white. And then uh, bone, fluid, soft tissue is going to be in between. Um, as you see more x-rays, you'll get more... Um, more, it'll become more obvious the difference between soft tissues and you can see if it's blood or fluid and whatnot. Um, but it's just, in the basics, just understand that stuff's bone here. So this is going to be soft tissue, so it's a little bit um, darker than the, the bone. Um, and then difference is in the bone, you're going to have different uh colors as well. The cortical bone, the cortex here is going to be brighter um, white because it's more dense than uh, your intermedullary canal or your cancellous bones. So when you're reading x-rays... Can I make a comment? Yep. Uh, so when we go back to the x-rays, uh, when, when you mean like soft tissue, so you, fluid it's more of like water versus fat. So fluid will more be things that have like a water density. So muscle will look pretty much the same or very similar to fluid on an x-ray and then fat will be kind of at that in-between level between air and fluid. Uh, so a lot of times when you're looking for like fat pad signs you can tell that boundary between the two of those. thought you were leaving Ruskin. Tucker, Tucker wanted to join. <laughs> All right. um, so when you get asked to hey read this x-ray the first thing you want to do is identify what you're looking at, um, what bones you're looking at, what views you're looking at. Um, so most of the time when we're getting x-rays, we're either getting two or three views, um, sometimes more with special views. So um, the majority of the long bones are getting two views. At the wrist, the ankle, the hand, uh, the foot are going to be three views, which are going to be usually an AP, a lateral, and then some type of oblique. Um, so if I was asked to read this ankle x-ray, I would say three views of an ankle, an AP, a mortise, and a lateral. The mortise is an oblique uh, view that's looking down the ankle joint, and it's about 10 to 15 degrees of internal rotation, which is going to get you this view. Um, and it's going to show you your uh, gutters, your medial lateral gutters, and um, your uh, ankle joint here. Um, and then, like I said, we'll, we have special views for different types of areas of the body or, or different things. This here is an axillary view of the shoulder. Um, and this keys us into uh, shoulder dislocations at the glenohumeral humeral joint. So here is the proximal humerus. Um, and then this is the glenoid. And you can see here it's well located. Um, majority of the time, shoulder dislocations are anterior and inferior. And so you're going to see the uh, humeral head up here anteriorly. So after you identify your bones and your views, you want to identify what type of um, location is the fracture. So this could be either di uh, diaphyseal, which is the center of the bone, or it could be intraarticular, 
epiphyseal or in between at the metaphysis. Um, so you want to say there's a fracture at the diaphysis or fracture that goes intraarticular. After you identify a location, then you're going to get into different characteristics of the fracture. Um, so there's a whole range and whole different types of ways to describe this. So the simple ones are going to be transverse, oblique, um, or spiral. Your transverse is going to be, as it states, pretty much horizontal up to about 30 degrees of uh, angulation. Once it gets past 30 degrees, then you can say something's oblique. Uh, the oblique fractures and spiral fractures are sometimes uh, tricky to understand the difference um, because as you can see here, it kind of looks the same that it's the spiral is oblique, but the spiral is always going to have this little spike here um, as the way uh, the bone breaks because the spirals are due to rotational forces. Um, so as you get a rotational force, it's going to um, give you this spike. Um, you'll see. We'll, I have an example uh, later of a real x-ray that um, will point this out again. Um, you can also have a butterfly fragment um, that's here. It kind of looks like you know a triangle. Um, and this is due to uh, a force that's uh, coming in from the side of the butterfly fragment. Um, you can also have things that are comminuted or multiple pieces. Um, you can have segmental which means that it's broken in multiple spots, two spots. And this uh, piece in the middle is called the intercalary segment. Uh, and lastly, you can have a, a depression, and that's going to be at your articular surface. So um, the, this is a proximal tibia, the uh, tibial plateau. And normally, the surface should be here, and um, it's depressed. And this is due to an impaction injury of the articular surface. If you look on the radiograph here, the plateau surface should be here, but you can see that there's this uh, portion here that's depressed here. Um, next, you want to say if the fracture is displaced or not. Um, so it could be not displaced, it could be displaced, or in this uh, uh, example, it's a buccal fracture. Um, which the, the bone's just deformed rather than a total fracture through it. Um, this is going to be common in kids uh, because their bone's more elastic than adults. So if the bone's fractured, you want to comment on the um, type of displacement. And so when we talk about displacement, we determine the amount of displacement by the distal fragment. So in this case, we're looking at femurs, so we're going to look at this distal portion and say which way it's displaced. And it can be translation, angulation, rotation, um, or shortening. So in multiple different planes, you can have uh, displacement. So <clears throat> in the uh, coronal plane, uh, you can have either translation or angulation here. Um, and so First, for translation, it's just pretty much a shift in uh, the medial lateral direction. So in this case, again, we look at the distal portion, um, and this is a medially displaced uh, fracture. Here, this is uh, an x-ray of uh, the tibia, um, an AP of the tibia uh, and fibula. And so this is the lateral because the fibula is over here. And so again, we look at the distal fragment, and we can see that it's translated laterally. Um, just to point out that this is a spiral fracture, because you can see this oblique line here, but then it comes up here uh, to this spike. So if when you're looking for spiral fractures, just look for this spike, and that'll clue you in. Uh, next, they can be angulated, and they can be angulated in the coronal plane, sagittal plane. So when they're angulated in the coronal plane, we talk about if they're in varus or valgus. Um, and in the sagittal plane, it's uh, procurvatum or rec uh, recurvatum. Um, forget. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah. So in the coronal plane, uh, varus means um, 
that it's going to be angulated in. Um, and valgus means that the distal fragment is going to be angulated outwards. Uh, so in this example here, again, we're looking at an AP of the uh, tibia and fibula. And this is the lateral side, medial side. So this distal fragment is pointing um, out laterally. So this is an, a valgus. And um, when we talk about the sagittal plane, progravano means uh, the apex is anterior, and recurvano means that the apex is posterior. And so here's a, a lateral, the tibia and fibula. Uh, this is posterior, this is anterior, and so the apex is posterior, so this is uh, in recurvato. Uh, sometimes it could be a little bit tricky just by looking at it. So what you can do is draw lines down. Uh, the shafts of the bones, and it'll clue you into um, if the apex is, you know, posterior, anterior, or uh, which direction the uh, angulation is in. Jeremy, can I just add something here? So, this was um, talking about things in varus and valgus is something that takes a little bit of time to wrap your head around. It seems simple at first, but then you'll find instances where you can confuse yourself. Um, looking at the hip can sometimes be a little confusing. Jeremy said it very uh, articulately and nicely that the distal fragment is what you're looking at. When the distal fragment is deviated towards the midline, then we call that varus. And when it's deviated away, we call that valgus. I remember in medical school, someone told me that if the knees are in valgus, it's like you can hold a piece of gum between your knees. And when you're in varus, it's like there's too much air in between your knees. Um, I don't know, that can help sometimes, but if you just think about it as being that, uh, the bowing, it can be confusing, but the more strict definition of thinking about which direction did the distal segment go, that'll always clue you in. Um, and then fractures can be, uh, rotated as well. I, I find that rotations, one of the harder things to, um, learn initially. Um, it just takes looking at normal x-rays, I think, to completely understand this. Um, but they can be internally or externally rotated. Um, this example here, uh, AP of the humerus, the best way I think to look at it is you look at the proximal joint, you look at the distal joint, and see if um, they look in their normal anatomic position. So the proximal, this looks like a normal AP of the glenohumeral joint uh, with the greater to, uh, out here. And then this isn't a normal looking AP of the uh, humerus. So you can see overlap of the um, ulna and uh, radius here. So you know that there is a, a component of rotation. Um, and then lastly, uh, fractures can be shortened or distracted. The majority of the time they're shortened uh, due to the muscular forces uh, that cross over the fracture site. Um, however, if they're distracted, then you don't want to think about if, is there some type of uh, neurologic injury. Um, often you'll see humerus shaft fractures that are distracted. And if you see that, then you want to potentially think of is there a brachial uh, plexus injury? Um, you'll see that often on motorcycle drivers that are holding on to their, um, uh, uh, to the steer, uh, not the steering wheel, but the, um, the motorcycle. And when they get um, into a crash, they fly over the handlebars of the motorcycle and they hold on to it and get a brachial uh, plexus injury. And then if they break their uh, humerus, you're going to see that it's distracted because they have no muscular forces that are pulling that um, the humerus to be in a shortened position. Um, so here I just had an example. Um, if someone wants to unmute their mic, we can go through it. Um, you know, by identifying a location and, and talk about the characteristics and displacements. Um, if I don't get any volunteers, I'm going to pick on someone. Hey, Dom. You want to give it a shot? Sure. Hi, guys. Uh, so this is uh, an AP and a lateral of a um, 
tibia, left tibia and fibula. Uh, it looks like there's a seg oblique or spiral component uh, to the fracture. It's segmental with some uh, comminution in the uh, mid shaft. And it's minimally displaced. Yep. Um, so you can comment when it's segmental. Uh, like you said, you can comment on the proximal portion and the distal portion. So you, like you said, it's um, oblique, spirally. The distal segment's comminuted. Um, what do you think about uh, displacement? Do you think this is overall in varus or valgus? This would be in um, this would be in varus, the, based off the distal fragment, the, the distal segment. So this is medial, this is lateral. Oh. If I draw a line down here and then drew a, oh. a line here, which way do you think it's angulated out? Yeah, that, that's in valgus. Yeah. So it's, it's very, very easy to, to trick yourself if you were to look at that proximal fracture line. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the intercalary piece there, you could... If you were to draw a perfect line in the intercalary piece, I don't know, it's pretty close there, but you could almost say that that part is in varus relative to the proximal extent of the tibia, but the overall injury itself is in a valgus deformity. Oh, that's not a straight line. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so overall... That's going that way. And then what do you think about um, this, this lateral? I'm drawing a line down. So that would be in a uh, proker bottom? Yeah, so that it's, you know, slight apex anterior or a proker bottom, like you're saying. Um, and then also, whenever you have two bones, um, you also want to comment on both of them. Um, so majority of the time when we're doing tibia, tibia, uh, tibia fractures, we draw our, our eyes and we talk about the tibia um, and then say there's an associated fibula fracture. So um, you say the associated fibula fracture and then you want to say the location of it. So it's, um, you know, associated fibula fracture at the level of the, um, the distal uh, tibia fracture. Um, you can say it's either proximal or distal to it, same level. Um, whenever things are at the same level, um, it's going to be a higher energy injury. And also, whenever it's segmental, that also keys you into a higher energy uh, injury. Um, so this is segmental with the fibula fracture at the same level. This is I don't know how this guy got hurt or a girl got hurt, but it's going to be a high energy and, uh, mechanism. Yeah. Anybody have questions about these x-rays here? I can't see the chat, so I don't know. Don't worry about the chat for now. We'll, um, we'll try and store up some of the things going on in the chat and we can, are we, was that the end of the presentation there, no. Jeremy? I can't remember. No, I messed it up. We can uh, monitor the chat, and we'll store up a few questions for the end as well. Jeremy, did you play for the Cowboys? No. All right. All right can you guys see the screen again? Yes. All right. Um, so we got another example if someone wants to give it a shot. JT number two, you want to give a shot? Sure. Um, so we're looking at a AP of the right forearm. I see a distal third ulnar fracture, uh, oblique in nature. Um, yep. Minimally displaced. Uh, which way is it? displaced laterally yeah so with um, forearm um, 
lateral immediately sometimes is a little bit tricky. So a lot of times we'll say if it's radial or ulnarly uh, translated. So, so ulnarly yeah. translated. Yeah. Any uh, angulation that you see? Um, Not really. The proximal segment, maybe. Yeah. I mean, maybe a tiny little bit. Again, me drawing this isn't going to be that accurate. Um, but it, if anything, it's probably five degrees angulated. Not not so much. Uh, and then is it shoring or, or is it um, about... Uh, uh, slight shortening. Line? Yeah. So I don't know how to erase this line. But you can see here, if you look at the uh, edges of the fracture, at these spikes... Uh, this spike here should key in to here, so you know that it's just a little bit short and by a couple millimeters. And again, here there's overlapping of this spike on this cortex here, so you know it's shortened. Good, Jen. Is there anything else you can comment on the X-ray besides the bones too, particularly in this type of injury? Uh, there's notable soft tissue swelling. Exactly. So it's more than just looking at the bones, looking at the fractures. I mean, this is termed the nightstick injury. Um, where you do have soft tissue swelling and a normal subcutaneous bone, you see a lot of soft tissue ulnarly on that forearm. Alrighty. So that's it for uh, x-rays. Anybody have any questions in general about that? Or we can, we can go back to it later if need be. Um, so then after you go down to the trauma bay, you do your physical examination, you identify what's injured, you initially want to immobilize it. And this is going to be with splints, casts, um, certain types of uh, slings or braces. Um, and the purpose of splints are they're temporary. Uh, if the extremity is swollen due to the fracture or other reasons, this gives um, a little bit more freedom and allows um, for swelling. The cast is going to be circumferential. So if anything's swollen or you think that has the pot uh, potential to increase in swelling, you want to stay away from cast. Or if you guys see with a lot of our pediatric fractures, we'll, we'll cast them and then um, make cuts or bivalve the cast, and that allows for some swelling. Um, but mostly casts are going to be for your definitive treatment. Um, and then your braces are, and slings are going to be usually temporary for certain reasons. A lot of the times you put someone in a sling um, so you can facilitate movement um, with like, say they have a uh, radial head fracture that's not displaced. You put them in a sling for a day or two just to um, help with their initial pain relief, but then you want them to start moving their elbow to, um, so they don't get stiff. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different casts and, and splints. Um, just in general, when you're putting on splints, there's a couple different types. You can either use plaster or, or orthoglass. Um, orthoglass is nice. I don't know if, if you guys seen it. It comes, you know, ready uh, pre-made. It has your uh, fiberglass material inside, some padding. Um, so that's nice because it's it's quick and easy. However, the plaster is a little bit better to mold. So if you have any type of injury that you're reducing and you're relying on your molds to hold that reduction, you want to use plaster over orthoglass. Um, a lot of times we'll use orthoglass if it's more so temporary, if there's an open fracture that we know is going to the operating room. Um, in a couple hours, we can just throw them in orthoglass. It's a little quicker uh, and easier on, on the resident. Um, whenever you're splinting with uh, plaster, this is stuff important. Once, once you guys go on uh, away rotations, and you know, it's definitely for fourth years, uh, when you're down in the trauma bay, ways to help out is to get materials going. Um, and so if you know how, what splints to apply, how to apply those splints, what materials you need, you're going to press um, the resonance. So um, things that make up the splint is your, grab your plaster or orthoglass, uh, then you want to get your web rill or, or other padding, whatever they have in the emergency room, and then uh, ACE wrap. 
and then you want to get your wa uh, water. So for splints, the plaster lukewarm water is pretty good. It gives you a good enough time to uh, manipulate it and mold it. If you're casting, you want to use cold water because the casts give off an exothermic reaction. And so if you use hot water, you can potentially burn the, uh, what are you doing, uh, Potentially burn someone. Um, for the upper extremity, you can use eight to 10 layers of plaster. The lower extremity, 10 to 14. I kind of just use 10 for everything, make it easy. Um, that way you don't have to think. Um, so there, like I said, there's a bunch of different splints. We'll go through a couple of them, uh, you know, briefly. Um, the first one is a posterior arm uh, splint. Um, this is going to be applied just distal to the shoulder. And then in this picture, it shows it's going past the wrist. Most of the time you end just proximal to the wrist. Because most of your time that you're putting these on are going to be for distal humerus fractures or any type of fractures or dislocations at the elbow. Um, sometimes you'll use it for radial or ulnar shaft fractures um, or just proximal ulnar uh, shaft fractures. Um, and you want to mobilize them at 90 degrees um, the best you can. Uh, for elbow dislocations, they're going to be more stable in uh, more degrees of flexion. So you want to make sure that you get it to at least 90. Sometimes if it's really unstable, you might have to go past 90. Um, the problem with going past 90 um, in splints and casts, you're going to kink the neurovascular bundle in your antecube fossa. So um, if you're going to have to put something past 90, it's going to it should be you know pretty temporary. Uh, the next is a the cuff and collar. Um, this one's this is the best console you can get for proximal humerus fractures because you just got to throw them in this cuff and collar. And what it is is you take two uh, pieces of stock and net um, and you make two loops and you tie them together. So you make a large loop around the neck and then a small one around the wrist and you kind of tie them together to make like a, a two links. Um, and you want to position it where you have the wrist or hand um, a fair amount above the elbow because the whole purpose of this uh, splint or um, sling you can call it is to uh, allow gravity to work and uh, use the, the weight of the elbow and the humerus to pull the humeral shaft straight um, so you can align your proximal humerus better to your uh, humeral shaft. Jeremy will you just contrast that to what would typically be done by like ER physicians for this? Yeah, so a lot of times they'll just throw them into a sling. The sling is gonna have the arm in about 90 degrees. Also, when you're in a sling, you're gonna be resting your forearm in the sling and you're not gonna be allowing gravity to pull your arm down. Um, so this is a much, much better uh, for, for the patient, uh, align your, the shaft better up to the proximal humerus. It's also good, um, to point out to them to continually range their fingers, wrist, and they can also easily come out of this wrist piece to work on range of motion of the elbow. Um, and then once the proximal humerus starts healing, they should come out of this completely to work on shoulder range of motion. Uh, the next uh, splint is the coaptation splint. Um, it's mainly just used for humeral shaft fractures um, in the initial uh, phase of their treatment. Um, this is kind of annoying to put on because it, it starts in the axilla and it wraps around the elbow and comes up uh, to the trap. Um, and then you attach a uh, stockinette or some type of strap to the wrist to hold the, um, give support to the wrist. Um, this gives just good uh, medial to lateral uh, stability of the humeral shaft fracture. The next one's the sugar tong, and this is um, mostly used for distal radius fractures or any radial or ornal shaft fractures. Um, and it's <clears throat> positioned to, you start it just uh, proximal to um, the MCPs on the dorsal surface. 
you wrap it around the elbow, and then you want to end it just proximal to uh, the <clears throat> the crease of at your MCPs. Um, the reason why this is good uh, for distal uh, radius fractures is because when you wrap it around the elbow, it gives some rotational control um, as well as your control over your uh, your dorsal and volar direction. Um, as I mentioned, you want to pay attention to where you start and end this uh, splint because if you send it past your MCEPs, uh, mostly on the volar surface, they're not going to be able to flex down their fingers. Uh, so you want to make sure you and you end it uh, before that so you can uh, not get the fingers stiff um, during uh, immobilization of the wrist. Guys, if you have any questions, just fire them into the chat. Just want to remind you guys, we'll group them for the end. Um, next one is uh, thumb spike, uh, um, which is going to be for any uh, thumb fractures or wrist fractures, specifically the skate forward. Uh, we use this often in. Um, and it's going to be on the radial side of the forearm, extending up to the thumb. Um, and kind of just wraps around both surfaces, the volar and uh, dorsal surfaces. Um, when you're doing it for a scaphoid fracture, you can end it at uh, just proximal to the thumb IP joint. Um, if it's for a thumb fracture, then you want to extend it to the whole thumb. Um, this is probably the easiest uh, splint to put on. Uh, now going to the lower extremity, um, the short leg Stimson. It's also, I've heard it called uh, the AO splint. Um, it's mostly used for ankle fractures um, that are rotational or pilon fractures that have interarticular extension um, or any type of foot fractures. Um, and it has two portions, uh, a U and an L. So when you put the U on, you want to start just distal to the knee and wrap it around the malleoli um, up on the, the medial lateral sides. And then the L portion is going to be at the posterior uh, portion at the calf, wrapping around the heel and then to the, uh, <coughs> uh, the plantar aspect of the foot. Um, and you want to extend it um, just to the toes. If you're, you know, for a foot fracture, you might want to extend it a little bit uh, past the toes so that there's no flexion of the uh, toes. If it's for an ankle fracture, you can end it just uh, at proximal to the toes so they can uh, flex and extend their toes. Um, <clears throat> the long leg Stimson is very similar and majority of the time we're using it for tibia fractures. Um, and again, so this has two portions. It has an L and it also has a U. The reason why I'm saying a J portion is because it's much easier to put on if you make two J's. So the way you do it for the L portion, it's going to be from the proximal thigh and the posterior uh, aspect. It's going to go down to the calf, around the heel, to the uh, plantar aspect of the foot, just similar to your short leg Stimson. Um, but now you're going to take two J's. You can take a U and wrap it, um, go from the proximal thigh wrap it around the malleoli and come to the medial thigh, but it's easier um, just to control because that U is going to be very, very long uh, piece of uh, plaster. So if you make it into two J's, you can start on the lateral thigh, um, wrap it around the lateral malleoli, and then end it just proximal to the medial mal. And then you can take the other uh, J, start on the medial aspect, it wraps around the medial malleoli and then ends just proximal to the lateral mal. Um, the reason why we use this for tibia fractures is it's similar to the idea of the sugar tong splint um, where it helps with rotation. So when you're passing the knee joint, it's going to help um, <coughs> the, uh, the tibia to um, uh, rotate and give you a little bit more stability. Uh, your last one is um, the medial lateral slabs, um, and we use this mostly for any type of knee fractures, so any distal femurs, proximal tibias, uh, patella fractures, um, and it's just two slabs on the medial lateral side of the uh, legs. So you start 
at the lateral proximal thigh, and you end it at the just proximal to the lateral malleoli. And then you kind of do the same thing on the medial side, so the medial proximal thigh, so the proximal, uh, just proximal to the medial mal. Um, and you want to have, depending on what you, you're using it for, um, about five degrees of uh, knee flexion. If you're doing it for a patella fracture, you want to keep the uh, leg um, extended um, in zero degrees of flexion because you don't want to introduce any type of uh, distraction at your patella. Um, it's also important to make sure you, that you pad up the malleoli and you end the splint proximal to it because you can get, um, if you're leaving it on for a while and you have a patient in the uh, sick you, um, they can eventually get some ulcers in that area. So you want to make sure that you, you leave it proximal and pad up the malleoli. Um, and that's pretty much uh, what we got for you if you guys have any questions. Um, listed here is uh, our email addresses. If you have any questions about uh, going forward, uh, any suggestions for this, feel free to reach out to us. And then um, this is our Instagram uh, account. Um, if you guys want to uh, follow us, there's going to be some updates on that. Just uh, one quick comment to make. Um, guys, I sent out a, a pretty big email about the Zoom invitation. If you were not on it today, um, or if you know of anybody who wants to be on them for the future, if you could just shoot me uh, their emails and I'll add them to the group for the invite. Um, so just looking at some things that maybe we could go over. I didn't see too many other questions popping up in the chat. There were some uh, comments. Um, uh, Fernando was uh, commenting on the um, cuff and collar. Um, that one is honestly like um, all of the ER doctors that that I've interacted with, except for you know, at University Hospital, they kind of get used to seeing us put it on at put those on patients. But at other hospitals, it sort of looks very rudimentary. Kind of looks um, honestly stupid, um, and you have to kind of explain that to the patient. And it it does help to explain to them kind of the mechanics of it, how it works, why it works, why it's better than a sling. Um, and the principle being that if you allow the entire brachium, the arm, to hang free um, while only supporting the wrist, you can give them stability and comfort and lessen motion by supporting the wrist and also decrease edema and swelling in the hand, but still allow gravitational traction to help align the humerus, whereas a sling will just sort of stuff the elbow up and, and sh actually shorten through the fracture. Um, so helping patients understand that this rinky dinky dumb thing you're putting on them is actually better. Um, would I take someone out of a sling and replace them with this if it, they're already in a sling? I regularly do that. Um, if they are being seen in the ER by the ER physician and they're placed in a sling and then, you know, let's say um, a couple years down the road when I have my own practice and they're sent to me, that's fine. I would maybe just assess them, see how comfortable they are. But if I'm seeing them in, in the ER, I think that I can add value to their treatment by switching them to something that I think ultimately is better for their um, fracture. Adam was asking, how do you choose between a splint and a split cast? I thought that was a pretty good question. I don't know if anybody wants to take that one. Sure. Um, so we use casts very frequently in kids. Um, one of the major reasons is oftentimes we try and avoid operating on kids if we can. In general, you try and avoid operating on most people unless you can give add value and improve the patient's outcome with surgery. Um, for adults, um, putting someone in a cast is often indicated and can help uh, heal something, but um, it's all going to be dictated on how swollen the extremity is. If you, the major difference between a splint and a cast is that a splint is only, it's an open concept immobilization device. In other words, it's only on two or maximum three sides of the limb, and there's still space for swelling, whereas a cast is completely circumferential um, and 
creates an encasing within which the extremity can continue to swell and can continue to build up pressure. So if you bivalve it, that can allow um, some swelling reduction. But if the extremity is that swollen, that you would have to bivalve a cast, then they might not hold as well as that extremity decreases its swelling. So one of our attendings has told me, and I've sort of taken it to heart, that if you find yourself needing to bivalve a cast on an adult, you probably did the wrong thing. It was prob probably would have been better to splint them. Can I comment you? Sure. Um, you know, so the, the real thing is it's, it's really personal preference. There are some uh, places like where I'm at right now, actually all the residents put all their ankle fractures in the casts and there's five of them, even operative ones. Um, so the, the things to think about are that because casts are circumferential, they go around the entire extremity, they are more stable uh, than a splint would be. Uh, so if you're worried about the patient uh, like losing reduction, um, mainly that, then, you know, a, a cast would be better. Um, the casts are also are more durable. So if you think that someone's going to be needed to be treated non-operatively and you put them into a cast, you know, initially, you probably don't have to change that cast. But if you put someone into a splint, they're not lasting six weeks in that splint. The thing's going to fall apart. Um, so the act of switching someone from a splint to a cast at a certain point in your non-operative treatment, there's always a chance that your fracture can displace if you had to reduce the fracture uh, initially when, when you see them. Um, but it's, it's um, really like a personal preference, and you, like Joe was saying, you do have to take the swelling into account um, as well. But you can, you can, there's no one you can't really splint, there's no one you can't really cast. It's just, um, you kind of have to weigh like those things together. Ebony asked for a tibia fracture, what would be the difference on an x-ray if the distal fragment was a wedge fracture instead of a comminuted fracture? I think, Ebony, just to clarify what you're asking, is are you asking just what would be the initial management if you have a wedge fracture versus a comminuted fracture or um, just classifying it? That image that you had, Jeremy, with the segmental injury, and we were describing the characteristics of the proximal extent and the distal extent. Go ahead, Joe. Oh, sure. Um, you know, so I think not a whole lot with regards to initial management. Um, if you have a wedge fracture versus a comminuted fracture, some of the things to circle back on, if we had comminution, you think that there may be some higher energy associated. And again, one of the points Jeremy made was that if you have a fracture in the adjacent bone, like the fibula at the same level, uh, especially with comminution, this may be something that occurred with a higher energy mechanism. So these are the patients you have to be watchful of for things like compartment syndrome with associated soft tissue injury. Um, hopefully that answers, or if you have any other questions with that, we can. In terms of how you would describe this, it's easy to see how uh, the picture of a wedge comes into your head looking at that distal segment. And in fact, it probably was attempting to become a wedge. There were probably many things that were going on here and the fact that you see multiple patterns at once is another indicator that this was a high level a high energy level um, trauma so the way a wedge injury occurs is that the bone begins to bend and on the convex side of that bend the bone will fail in a split or we call it failing under tension and on the concave side it will fail in compression and usually that results in this triangular wedge that spits out. But if there was enough energy that there was enough compression on that concave side at the same time, it might not just spit out at a triangle, but instead that triangle would break into multiple pieces and we call that comminution or multifragmentary. So it's a little bit of both. One of the other things that Joe's probably going to talk a little bit more in his next lecture is um, some basic concepts of the way fractures um, occur and some of the terminology we'll use just to get you guys familiar. We talk about the tension side and the compression side of bone and oftentimes when you see these 
butterfly fragments that we described, those are on the compression side. And when you see more of a transverse pattern on the opposite side of bone, that's the type of fracture that appears um, when bone fails under tension. But we'll talk more for sure in the, le the next couple lectures about that stuff. And I think kind of the big thing that we're kind of getting after talking about describing x-rays is by able to by being able to classify these fractures as kind of the wedge versus the comminution, you are inherently kind of explaining how the fracture happened and the energy involved. Um, so in terms of Ebony's question about what the difference is between a wedge versus comminution, really, kind of as Joe explained, you are showing that it was both a bending wedge is probably the initial force, deforming force, but the energy level was high enough that it did result in comminution at that distal fracture site. So, yeah. Jeremy, thanks so much. That was a great lecture. There were a couple of things I wanted to circle back around, mostly on interpreting x-rays. Um, I wanted to point out one thing, one key thing when, when we, and I say we collectively as orthopedists, when we look at x-rays, we look at x-rays very different than a radiologist. Um, for uh, one main reason, well, two main reasons, I would say. One, we have in our mind what we are going to do to treat that fracture. And I can't speak for all radiologists, but I don't know if they look at injuries in the same way where they're looking at them with the mindset of what am I going to do for this? And the second thing is we have a cheat code. Okay, so the radiologist is sitting in a dark room looking at an x-ray and trying to figure out what's going on. But we have seen the patient, we have spoken to the patient, we have been given the opportunity to lay hands on the patient. Um, and so we have the cheat code, and Jeremy mentioned something really key about scaphoid fractures as being a very nice example of when an x-ray may not give the whole picture. But if your clinical suspicion is high, and if the story meet, um, matches up and you're worried about a fracture, it's, might, it's, it's seldom the wrong answer um, to put someone in some form of immobilization for a short period, maybe a week, and bring them back and take a look at them and see how they're doing. And if they're tender there, then there's probably some injury there. And then you start adding in all of the little knowledge parts that you have, like you know that there is very commonly an injury in that part of the body that gets missed. And that just comes with time. But I would encourage you as you start seeing patients on your acting internships to not just get caught up on what you do or don't see on the x-ray, but really hone in your physical exam skills. And the second thing I would add is um, a little bit of, on the subtleties of reading an x-ray. Um, learning to interpret different shadows, learning to interpret lines. Uh, as you start to take on the task of looking at x-rays, it doesn't really matter what system you use just find a system and stick to it. And that used to actually infuriate me when people told me that. Um, what I mean by that is go about reading x-rays the same way every time. And the only way I know to tell you is just I can give you the example of how I do it, and you can see if that works for you or you can mix it up. When I look at an x-ray, the first thing I do is I trace the lines of the cortices. Okay, so I go along the outsides of the bone and I see if all of those contours are smooth or if I see any breaks in it. The next thing I do is I look at the joint um, and I look to see are the two bones at a joint in the relative correct alignment to one another and does that relationship look right? Does it look symmetric? Does anything look off? The next thing I do is I look at the bone characteristics itself, the medullary canal, the metaphysis, the trabeculations of the bone, and I stare very, I look intently at that because that's where you can miss some subtleties. You can miss tumors, things that are a little more insidious might show up early on um, at within the, the medullary canal. And then lastly, I look at the soft tissues. Um, and look around and look at all of the lines and see if there are any shadows and curvatures that don't look right. And if you see a line on an x-ray that you think is a fracture, see if that line continues off into the soft tissues. Because if it respects the boundary of the bone, then that line is a part of the bone. Maybe it's a fracture.
But if you see that line continuing off into the soft tissues, it may just be an overlap or a wrinkle in the sheets that's being picked up as a shadow. Um, and the last thing I would say is look at normal x-rays. Look at a lot of them. Every time you see a patient on your AI, Google a normal x-ray of that extremity and see what normal looks like and familiarize yourself with normal. Uh, because the more you learn to recognize normal, the more quickly you'll be able to pick up things that are wrong. I'll just end it abruptly like that. Yeah, and one other thing to point out is everybody gets drawn to the big injury, or if the you get a consult and the ER attending or residents telling you you have a you know certain type of fracture, you want to look at the whole X-ray. So you know, look down at the ankle, look at the knee, make sure you're not missing any other things. You can see um, often see different obliquities of the images. Um, a little bit different at, at different levels of the joints. So sometimes just using different x-rays views to look at different joints will key you in to see if there's a, a fracture that you might miss. Um, so like Joe was saying, look at the whole entire thing, not, not just at the, the thing that draws your eye first. Um, Albert was asking if these PowerPoints would be available somewhere afterwards. Um, we don't, yet have a plan for that, Albert, but I think that we could find a plan for that. Um, I think we could arrange that some way. Yeah, we could probably just email them out or, or what. I'm also trying to record this. Uh, I don't know how uh, the record function is going to work, um, but if it's good quality, um, we can also try to distribute that as well. Any last questions? Joe, do you want to give a teaser what next lecture will be? I don't know what the le next lecture is going to be. Ooh. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I think sure. basic uh, fracture healing and principles <laughs> of fixation. Sure. So um, in the next talk, we'll be looking a little bit at um, more specifics of what we talked about. Um, we'll look at trying to understand what we what information can we get from an x-ray that's a step above um, here is a fracture here is what it looks like um, in the next one we'll talk about how do I interpret what the energy was why did why did this particular pattern develop and how might that influence what I want to do about it yeah we'll talk about different types of screws, uh, plates, um, and what their functions are. All right, so we'll shoot uh, next week again, same time, 7 p.m., um, and we'll, we'll do another hour or so. Um, and again, if you guys want to have certain topics discussed, um, feel free to email us um, or, or reach out to us any way you want, and, and we can make this... Um, certain topics as, as we go. So thanks everybody. For I, showing I up. hope that maybe along the road, as we get a little bit later, uh, we can maybe start filtering in some questions as well about, um, you know, residency, what that is like and how do you prepare for it and that sort of stuff.